Hello, Business 630 students. This is Professor Hassey. This is our week two lecture video for Business 630 for the fall two session, uh, November 1st through November 7th. And our topic this week is capital valuation. How to value capital, how to value stocks, how to value bonds, how to value money. And this is a pickup from chapter six, our first week discussion, and chapters four and five in this week's uh, textbook. This all leads up to our first case study, which will be given out next week, not this week, but next week, and it is due November 14th. So our topic this week is capital valuation, and I want to go over a couple of infrastructure things about our class. Then we'll get into talking about the time value of money and debt valuation, which probably for many of our 29 students in this class is kind of a refresher. For some students, it might be some new material. And then we'll talk about uh, um, our plan for the week and then get ready for our Friday video, which we'll talk about the article that you had to read last week on capital and the new definition of finance and that lead into our discussion uh, for next week. So first of all, let's go to our uh, Blackboard uh, site. Okay, so I hope you all have had a chance in the last week to uh, get to know our Blackboard site and what's going on. Uh, again, we're starting off rather easy as far as material is concerned for these first couple of weeks and again, begin to pick up the pace in week three with our first case study. But again, a couple of things to note. Remember, you all have posted uh, your uh, company selections for this uh, session and also a little bio, and I appreciate all your, uh, your bios. It was great getting, it helps me get to know you, get to know uh, our class and maybe help me in, in prep planning material for our class as we move along. Again, remember the, uh, whenever I post a video or post an email or send an email to you, I uh, also, it's automatically posted to the announcements. This is our uh, last week's Friday video that I posted and a link to it in the email. I sent you all. Again, it's a good idea to check your Laverne email on a daily basis uh, just for all your classes you're taking or all the information from Laverne to stay on top of that. Just don't go to your email on Saturdays. You might miss a, quite a bit during the course of the week. Here's our Zoom YouTube links uh, folder in Blackboard. Uh, this is a, a thing that I'm uh, speaking at tomorrow. I thought I'd post that, but you guys don't have to go to this. Uh, part of the, this is homecoming week at the university uh, when alumni uh, come back to campus. But this year, not too many alumni are coming back to campus because of the pandemic. So we're having a series of lectures and discussions. And I'll be run, uh, leading one uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, November 2nd, uh, for, at the noon hour. Uh, and uh, you're more than welcome to, to attend, but you don't have to, it's no big deal. Uh, but also here's the links to last week's Friday video, last week's lecture video. There'll be two videos, as I mentioned, every week, every Monday and every Friday. The Monday video sets the topics for the week. The Friday video takes a look at sample problems, uh, calculations and highlights or gets you ready for any assessment work of that coming week. There'll be no assessment work this week, but the Friday video this Friday, we're gonna talk about the, uh, the article that you've been reading that you'll be using in, uh, later on in the course, Efficient, Chaotic, What's the New Finance? We'll be reviewing that article in our Friday video and also looking at some sample problems about time value of money, bonds and stocks and risk and return. So these are where the, those videos are located. If you go to the student discussion forum, I have a forum set up every week where this will be updated for week two, where you can post questions or concerns and I can answer them for you. And then we get into our weekly, weekly file folders. And here's the file folder for this week, which with our agenda, the agenda that you saw at the beginning of this video. And with a couple of videos, this is one we're gonna watch right now in the course of our lecture today, this video. And then there's some other great videos about bonds, stocks, and getting to know that. So, and this will happen to go into our lecture and discussions. And there's the PowerPoints of chapters four and five, which is sometimes some good tools, some more videos. And here's the uh, results of our uh, 
students selecting uh, firms last week in our week number one with your bios. I've asked you to select a company and all of you found the beta of those companies, which we'll be using subsequently in case number one. Uh, as you can see, we have a pretty good list of companies uh, throughout our course, uh, ranging from Abbott to Texas Instruments. Uh, we had we had a, a few uh, people sp uh, select Tesla, rightly so. A few people select Amazon, uh, but overall we had a pretty good cross section of the corporate status of America. And I'll be looking forward to hearing your interpretation and analysis of these companies in the context of our course. So uh, thank you. That's a great cross section of companies, and uh, I look forward to the information you will provide me, and hopefully, it'll give you some information about your individual company. So that's that's that was good from last week. So before we get started on the week, let's take a look at this time value of money explained, which will set the stage for our discussion in this video. Remember. The definition of finance from last week is the definition of maximizing shareholder value, value, understanding the return required based on the risk for an investor, for you as a company, and the risk in investing in assets, and hopefully those assets will provide you an adequate return. And a lot of that is calculated by the time value of money, the value of money today versus the value of money in the future the value of money in an annuity, a series of payments over time, the value of money in an amortized schedule. An amortized loan is in the loan of debt where you make equal payments every month for a period of time to pay back interest and principal on an obligation. And if you ever have a car loan or a mortgage, those are amortized loans, series of equal payments over time. So let's take a look at this overall broad view of the time value of money. Any accounting courses or any basic finance courses, you've probably been exposed to something uh, called the time value of money. So we hear this concept a lot and something very important to the foundations of finance and to some degree accounting. So we want to talk about, well, what does this mean from a conceptual point of view. What, it, what is the concept here? What are we talking about when we say that money uh, has a time value? So, so let's, let's look at this through an example. So let's, let's take an example here. Let's say that I offer you, you two options. Okay, now one of the options is going to be that I give you $100 cash today. $100 today. And then in the other option, we're going to say that I give you, let's change colors here again. Let's say I give you $100 one year from now. One year from now. Now, let's just assume for a moment that when I say I'll give you the $100 one year from now, uh, that that's certain. That's not something that, that I might not pay it or, or something like that. It's, it's guaranteed. You either get $100 today or you got $100 one year from now, but either way, there, there's no risk associated with it. You're going to get the, the $100. So let's look at these two options. Now, which would you prefer? Now, you might say, well, I just prefer the $100 today because I just I just want the money. I have something I'm already going to spend it on. But let, let's just forget about that for a moment. Let's assume that you don't have necessarily have anything you want to buy, but you do want the $100. Well, you, you might think, well, I'm indifferent. Uh, whether I get it today or whether it's one year from now. But but let's think about this because the money has a time value. Now now let's illustrate this. So let's 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 look at a little timeline here. So here in this option we're getting the hundred dollars right here, which we'll call we'll call this that's today, right right here. This is today. And then over here, uh this is this is one year from now. One year. Uh, now let's let's go down uh, to our other option, and we'll have a little timeline. And again, we've got uh, right here is is today, and you're not getting anything today. There, there's nothing here uh, because you're getting it one year from now. You're going to be handed uh, right here a hundred dollars. Now let's let's think about things here for a moment. So when we get the $100 here today, 
what can we do with that money? Well, you could go out and spend it or something, but let's just assume that you, did, you didn't spend it. Well, what else could you do? You could invest that money. Now, let's say that you invested in something and you, you ended up getting uh, a 5% return. Let's say you took it to the bank and uh, you, you got a 5% return on, on some kind of investment. Now, what's going to happen is that at the end of that year, you don't have $100 anymore. Well, what do you have? Uh, you're going to have 100 times 1.05, which is going to be, uh, that's going to be $105. So, we see that if you get the money today, if you get it sooner rather than later, there's a value to getting it earlier because it can be invested to earn a rate of return. And then at the end of the period, you end up having more money than what you started with. Now, when we look at the other option where you get $100 at the end of the year, you didn't have the option uh, of investing it here uh, because you didn't have the money. So when you get the money sooner rather than later, it has more. there's more value there because you can go ahead and invest the money and earn a return on it. So that's what we're talking about uh, when people say, uh, that the time value of money uh, they're just basically saying that money is something that if you're looking at cash flows uh, cash flow today or cash flow in the future uh, a cash flow today all else equal the same amount is going to have more value because it can be invested for that that return uh, so now you might be thinking well how does this how does this have real world applications or, or what are we thinking about but let's let's say we've got some project that the firm is thinking about that project you might say okay well we're going to uh, buy this machine and, and it would uh, get, get generate cash flows over a period of let's say five years. So you can look at these these different years and you can go and say okay here's here's year one, two, three, four, five and you can say okay well we estimate that in year one if we get this machine uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a hundred dollars in cash flow in year two 175 uh, year three 200. Uh, 300 and then let's say in the last year it only it generates 50 but what you can do is say okay well now we, we know we've got we, we're estimating these cash flows but now what we want to do is we want to say okay well like for example a year in year five that fifty dollars we can't just add all these all these together and say okay well now we've got this sum and this is how much it's gonna is gonna generate from this price we have taken into account that fifty dollars five years from now is not worth the same as fifty dollars today so what we're going to do is account for this uh time value uh, of money and uh tv maybe not the best uh well, acronym i have there but the time value of money we're going to look at this and we're going to say well what if we can just go ahead and say we earn a five percent interest on all our investments then we can say okay let's Let's figure out what that fifty dollars five years from now is worth to in terms of today's dollars. And when we do that, what we're doing is called discounting cash flows. So we're discounting cash flows. So those those that fifty here, this is a cash flow in year five. And what we're doing is we're saying what's the rate of return we could have earned on that on money today, let's say five percent, seven percent, whatever it is. And then in, let's use that to go ahead and, and discount this number and say, so it's going to be something less than 50 because maybe it's you know 30 or 35 or whatever, yeah, depending on your discount rate, could have been invested today to get 55 years from now. So when we talk about discounting cash flows, uh, what we're doing is we're using the, the time value of money concept and some other formulas that we're going to talk about in other videos uh, to take future cash flows and figure out uh, what are they worth today? Okay, that was kind of a simple video, but I think it's, you know, for some of us in this class, it's been a while since we've looked at this or even discussed the time value of money. So that was a good intro. We're going to take a look at uh, introduction to bonds uh, video in just a minute. But l let me tell you, if you go to week number two, uh, there's a uh, file folder within week two called week two class lecture notes. And here is a, a spreadsheet that we're going to talk about in just a minute that defines the time value of money, especially in terms for our class. And we're gonna take a look at an example there. Remember, uh, the reason why we're doing this is <clears throat> 
The bottom line is to create assets for a company, a capital investment that's going to produce revenue, less expenses, which is a profit or cash flow. That, that coupled with the working capital management of the company gives us a, a, a return analysis. It gives us a way of determining investment return. So when we take a look at a company like Apple Computer or take a look at any of the companies that you have selected, when we want to see their performance over time and into the future, many times we'll use present value to determine that current value of that investment in the future, looking at potential cash flows and revenue generation or cash flow generation in some respects called free cash flow, and, and what that present value of that money is. So let's take a look at that in the context of a, of a calculation. Here's that spreadsheet from week number two. And kind of like what the, uh, the gentleman was just talking about in the video we just saw, we are going to be doing a discounted cash flow. In other words, here's an investment of $100,000. And the cost of the investment, in other words, the interest or the cost of getting that $100,000 was 4%. That's the cost of capital, the opportunity cost, the hurdle rate. And this $100 investment is going to generate $140,000 of projected profits and cash flow into the future on the investment of $100,000. Well, when you first look at that, well, this is a pretty good investment. We're going to be paying out today $100,000, and we're going to generate $140,000 in the future based on our projections. And this 10-year life of this asset is determined or is sometimes called the depreciable life. Depre, nice spelling there, depreciable life of the asset, because that's how long we can depreciate it, the 10-year life. So this $140,000, how do we understand what's the present value of this $140,000 going to be received over 10 years? Well, we discount it. In other words, we take what is its value today? What is this $140,000 worth today? And what do we discount it at? The cost of the money today. 4%. So this is where I like you to use spreadsheets in this class because we can do these calculations very easily. You go to formulas, function, and we go to financial, the financial category of functions. And we look for an expression called net present value, NPV. We bring that up. And what it is, is we're going to use this calculation, this logarithm, to determine the present value of $140,000 being received in the next 10 years. What is it worth today at a discount rate of 4%, which is our cost of money? So we type in 4% under rate. And then under value, it's very simple. We just paint from year one to year 10. In this case, it's cell D7 to M7. We paint that whole series of cash flow. And what, what this calculation is now is going to take this money and discount it back to today at 4%, $108,427.28. That's the $140,000 in today's value. Well, why is this a good number? Because we know if we're spending $100,000 today and we anticipate generating in today's dollars 108,000 bucks, we're going to have what is called a net present value of 8,427.28. Over and above what we're spending, we're generating this money in today's value. This is called the discounted cash flow amount. This is called the net present value. We use the net present value formula to determine the discounted cash flow. This is what is called an annuity, a series of payments into the future. And then we discount those payments back at our cost of money to determine the net present value in relationship to the investment. Your electrics paper, which you're going to be doing as one of your case studies in this class, you are doing this analysis. That's exactly what we're doing here. The only difference is you got to also come up with these amounts. 
on a yearly basis. What is the cash flow? What is the revenue expenses, working capital? You're going to be calculating that and then applying that to this type of formula. That's the one of the key areas of corporate finance is being able to have the ability of recognizing your cash flow streams and then doing the calculations to determine profitability, return. And in this case, somebody already calculated the cash flow streams for us. Then we determine the net present value, and it looks like it's a pretty good investment in all, in all said and done. Now, some companies might want to earn more than $8,400, but in this case, with this cash flow and this cost of capital, that's our profit. This is a big item in this class to be able to come up with these calculations. And then we apply that to stocks and bonds investments. When we want to go out and finance a project by bonds, how do we do that? When we want to finance a project by stock, how do we do that? And this is further discussions that we will have in this class. So speaking of bonds, let's refresh ourselves with the definition of what a bond is. In this video, I want to give you a general idea of what a bond is and why a company might even issue them in the first place. And just at a very high level, a bond is essentially a way for someone to participate in lending to a company. So you're a partial lender, partial lender to a company. And just to make that more concrete, let's imagine some type of company that has $10 million in assets. So these are its assets right there, assets. And it has $10 million in assets. And let's say, just for the sake of simplicity, it has no liabilities. So all of that value, all of that $10 million, is what is owned by the owners or by the equity, the sh owner's equity. So this is $10 million, $10 million in equity. And if we had, let's say, a million shares, I'll write it down, if we have a million shares, and if we believe this $10 million number, that implies that each share is worth $10 per share. Now let's say this company is doing really well and it wants to expand. It wants to increase its assets by $5 million so it can go out and buy a $5 million factory. So it wants, let me draw it right here, it wants another $5 million in assets that it needs to build that factory, or essentially a $5 million factory. And the question is, how does it finance it? Well, one way is that they could just issue more equity. If they're able to get a price of $10 per share, they could issue another 500,000 shares, 500,000 shares at $10 per share. And then that would essentially produce $5 million. So this is scenario one. They issue 500,000 shares at $10 a share. They now have 1.5 million shares, but these new owners gave them collectively $5 million. So this, the equity would grow by $5 million. We now have 1.5 million shares. So this would now be 1.5 million shares, not 1 million. And that new money from these new shareholders would go into the asset side, and then we would use that to actually buy the factory. What I just described is essentially issuing equity or financing via equity. Financing via equity or by issuing stock. Now, the other way to do it is to borrow the money, to borrow the money. So let me redraw this company. I'll leave this up here just so we can compare the two. So once again, we have $10 million of assets. That's our $10 million of assets. We have $10 million of equity to start off with. $10 million of equity. And instead of issuing stock to get the $5 million, we're going to borrow the money. So we could, we're essentially issuing debt. So we issue, we essentially, we could go to a bank and say, hey bank, can I borrow $5 million? So we would have a $5 million in liability, it would be debt, $5 million of debt. And the bank would give us $5 million of cash that we can then go use 
to buy our factory. So in either situation, in either situation, the asset side of our balance sheet looks identical, or the assets of the company are identical. We had our $10 million assets, and now we have a factory. But in this first situation, I increased, I was able to raise that money by increasing the number of shareholders, by increasing the number of people that I have to split the profits of these of this of this company with. In this situation, I was able to raise the money by borrowing it. So these the people that I'm borrowing this money from, the people that I'm borrowing this money, this is borrowed money, borrowed money. They don't get a cut of the profits of this company. What they do is they get paid interest on their money that they're lending to us before these guys get any profits at all. In fact, that interest is considered an expense. So these guys get interest get interest. And even if this company does super, super well and becomes very, very profitable, these guys only get their interest. Likewise, if the company does really bad and these guys suffer, as long as the company doesn't go bankrupt, these guys are still going to get their interest. So they're going to be a lot safer uh, than, well, they don't get as much of the reward as the new equity holders would. They also don't get as much of the risk. Now, this is just straight up debt. And you could just get this from any bank. if. They were willing to. If they said, "Oh, you know, you're a good, safe company. We're willing to lend you five million dollars," but let's say that no bank uh, wants to individually take on that risk. So you say, "Hey, why don't instead of borrowing five million dollars from one entity, why don't I buy borrow it from five thousand entities?" So what I can do instead, instead of borrowing it from one entity, I could issue these certificates. I could issue bonds, and that's the topic of this video. So I issue these certificates. They have a face value of one thousand dollars. One thousand dollars. This is my face value. Face value. Or sometimes you'll hear the the notion of par value. Of par value. And I'll say what interest I'm going to pay on it. So let's say I I say it has a ten percent annual coupon. Annual coupon. And it's actually called, even though this is the interest, I'm essentially going to pay $100 a year. It's called a coupon because when they, when bonds were first issued, they would actually throw these little coupons on the bond itself. And the owner of the certificate could rip off or cut off one of these coupons and then go to the uh, person borrowing or the entity borrowing the money and get their actual interest payment. So that's why it's actually called coupons, but they don't actually attach those coupons anymore. And then it has some maturity date, the date that not only will I pay your interest back, but I'll pay the entire principal, the entire face value. So let's say the maturity, maturity is in two years is in two years. So in this situation, in order to raise $5 million, I'm going to have to issue 5,000 of these, because 5,000 times 1,000 is 5 million. So times 5,000. So if you wanted to lend $1,000 to this company so that they could expand, and if you think 10% is a good interest rate and it's a safe company, you would essentially buy one of these bonds. Maybe you buy it for $1,000. And when you buy that bond for $1,000, you are essentially lending this company that $1,000. And if you did that 5,000 times, or if that happened 5,000 times amongst a bunch of different people, this company would be able to raise its $5 million. Now just to be clear how the actual payments work, the coupons tend to get paid semi-annually. So let me draw a little timeline here. And this tends to be the case in the US and Western Europe. If this is today, this is today, this is in six months, this is in 12 months or one year, this is in 18 months, and this is in 24 months. And I'm only going up to 24 months because I said this bond matures in 24 months. So what is this? If you own, if you hold this bond, this certificate, what do you get? Well, it's going to pay you 10% annually, so $100 a year, $100 per year. But they actually pay the coupon semi-annually. So you get $100 a year, but you get half of it every six months. So you're going to get $50 after six months. You're going to get $50 after 12 months, or after another six months. You're going to get another $50 here. You're going to get a final $50 there. And they're also going to have to pay you back the original amount of the loan. They're also going to have to pay you 
the $1,000. So that last payment is going to be the coupon of 50 plus the $1,000. And so you will have essentially been getting this 10% annual interest. Now, when the company does this, they'll probably have to issue some type of new bond, because all of a sudden they have to pay all of these people this huge lump sum of money if they haven't been able to earn it from the factories yet. We could talk about that in a future video. OK, another good video explaining what debt financing is, the issuance of credit to pay an obligation uh, with coupon payments and the maturity at principal. Uh, so again, let's apply what we just talked about in chapter four about discounting and the time value or the present value of money with the problem we just saw in that video from chapter five. Let's say going back to that problem, we had a $1,000 bond that we issued and the coupon rate was 10% payable semi-annually every six months. So that means it's 5% a period or $50 payments every six months to the, uh, per, to the individual who lent us the money. Its maturity was in two years, which means there's four periods of $50 payments, okay? So that's what was explained by the gentleman in the video. But what happens after one year that the person who owns this bond wants to sell it? Okay, wants to sell it in the market. Okay, they don't want to wait another year to get the maturity value. They need to sell it now because they need the money. So, in other words, what is the value of this bond when they decide to sell it? Well, it has to, it's determined by two things. Remember, in the present value or the time value of money, it's issued, it's determined by three things. What are those, the, those three factors? in time value of money. Factor number one. Whoop. Factor number one is the principal, OK? The amount of money. In this case, it's $1,000, the amount of the bond. The second factor is the rate, the interest rate. Well, in this case, that's the coupon rate, which happens to be 10% annual rate. And three, what is the time? All right, how long? Two years. Payable semi monthly or semi annually. All right. Those are the three factors. Whenever you do a time value calculation, either present value, future value, whatever, you have to know those three things. How much money is involved? What's the rate or the interest on that obligation? And over what period of time, all right? So in this case, the principal is $1,000. The rate is 10%, but it's payable semi-annually. So that's 5% every six months, totaling to 10% a year. And it's over two years, okay? So now let's say one year goes by here, right here. One year goes by and I decide to go to my broker and uh, sell the bond after one year. I, gotta, I need the money now. I can't wait another year. I got to get the money, okay? So I go back to the bond market to see who would be interested in buying this bond, this 10% bond today. Well, I call up my broker and my broker says, Rick, we can sell the bond, uh, but... Uh, you got a, you got you you you're, you have a, a good thing, because right now the yield to maturity on this bond today is eight and a half percent. In other words, if this company would issue this bond today, not a year ago, but today, they would only have to pay eight and a half percent to their bondholders. Why has that happened? The market's changed in a year. The the demand for money, the credit rating maybe of this company, whatever. Remember last week, we talked about the risk-free interest rate, the 10-year United States Treasury yield, and how that has changed over the last six months this year. It was about 0.9% last year on December 31st, and now it's, today, I think it closed at a close to 1.6%. Interest rates have gone up. Well, in this case here, interest rates have gone down. This bond is now, it's yielding not 10%, but 8.5%. The yield to maturity tells us what its price in the market is. So how do I determine how much I would get from this bond today? Selling a 10% annual coupon bond in a market of 8.5% 
with one year left. What is the value, the present value of this debt obligation? Formulas, function, present value, not net present value, but PV, present value is the function under financial. What's the interest rate now per period? Well, per period, it's four and a quarter percent. Remember the yield to maturity is an annual rate of eight and a half. This is a semi-annual bond. So it's half of that, 4.25%. How many periods remain? Well, this is one year has gone by. So another year remains. So that's two periods. The payment amount on this bond, well, we get $50 every six months, that's 10% or 5% of $1,000 every six months. So $50 worth two more payments. And the future value is $1,000. That's what the maturity value is and what we'll get at the, sorry about the phone. That's what we'll get in one year's time. Notice I put negative signs in front of these amounts, minus 50, minus a thousand because in the course of the calculation of this calc of this formula, it'll convert those negatives to a positive. So now I've put in, what is this value of this four and a quarter percent bond in a market of 5% with two periods remaining with the principal being a thousand dollars? I get $114 in 10 cents. So I'm kind of happy. In other words, if I would sell this bond in the market today, I would make about $14. Why? Because this bond has increased in value because the interest rates have dropped. Why? Because somebody, whoever is buying this bond in the marketplace is going to pay $1,014.10 to get $50 payments. If I decided not to buy, sell this bond today, if somebody wanted to buy this bond or issue this bond today, they would only get what? $42.50 per payment. So I'm gonna be spending, and this is called, the bond is at a premium, which is above face value because of the interest rates are lower compared to the coupon of this bond. So it's more valuable. That's called a premium, all right? Interest rates in the market are lower, okay? Now, why is this important? You're not, you're, we're not gonna do many calculations with bond valuations or anything like that, but here's the important reason why we not need to understand this. It's talking about assets and asset values, all right? Interest rates drop, existing asset values are worth more. Now let's take another example. Let's say in another example of the same bond, we say that the yield to maturity now is 11. Now let's make it easier to calculate, 12.5%. All right, so that's six and a half, six and a quarter percent per period. So now look at interest rates have gone up. Interest rates have gone up. What has that done to the price of this bond today? Well, let's calculate that. Formula, function, financial, present value. Now the interest rate per period is not four and a quarter percent that it was here, it's now six and a quarter percent. Still two periods remain. Oop, sorry, can I put a decimal there? Six and a quarter percent, two periods remain. The payment is still $50. That's the original amount of the bond. And the future value is still $1,000. But now look what happens to this 10% bond in a market of 12 and a half percent with one year left. $977.66. The value of the bond has decreased below the $1,000 value. Because if somebody wanted to buy this bond today, they would get it cheaper. Why? Because 
why would they want to buy this bond today when they're when they could get 12 and a half percent when they buy this bond at $977.16 they're getting only 10%. This is called buying the bond at a discount which is below face value and the interest in the market is higher. And that's why so many people are freaking out today in the markets. What are interest rates doing today? They're getting higher. When interest rates are getting higher, existing assets, including bonds and stocks, we'll talk about stocks next week, are losing value. So my, my investments, if I have a lot of bond investments today and the interest rates in the market are going up, I don't want to sell those today because they're not going to be worth as much. I'm going to have to hang on to them probably. If I really have to sell because I need the money, I'm going to take a loss. But in periods of when interest rates are low, like it was two, three, four years ago, my assets were, have a greater value. The bond market was doing very well, but in high interest rates periods or inflationary periods like going on beginning now, interest rates are going up, existing assets are more expensive. And that kind of equates to what the housing market is doing right now. Inflation is heating up, right? So people who have mortgages, their value of those mortgages are decreasing in value because the asset base is more expensive in the marketplace. So we'll talk more about this next week, but this is a very important concept that's talked about in chapter five in relationship to debt financing, because, well, if we, ish, if we buy a bond today and just hang on for it for two years, we don't care. We're going to get $50 every six months and we're going to get our $1,000 in two years. But if we decide to sell that bond in a market of lower interest rates, that's a good thing. We're going to get more for it. But if we decide to sell that bond in higher interest rate periods, that bond is worth less and we're going to take a loss. But the key part of that or the macro view of that is in relationship to all assets. Interest rates go down, existing assets have an increased value. Interest rates go up, existing asset values are going down. And that's exactly where we are today. And as a CFO or a financial manager, it's good to know those characteristics about interest rates and valuation. And it's all calculated by using present value. So these are the two key areas. And I'm going to save this and post it back to Blackboard in week number two so you can look it over. But what is discounted cash flow of future cash flows? Chapter five. And what is the value of a bond in a changing market when interest rates, sometimes called bond yields, change due to market conditions? And that looks at all different types of assets. And the three key factors mentioned to determine the present value of money is determining what's the principal, the amount of money you're working with, the interest rate and the return on the money or the cost of the money and the time, how long a period. Right here in this problem we just looked at, the interest rate is 4%. Here's the principal is 100,000 over 10 years. Here's the cash flow, and we determine the present value. In chapter five under bonds, here's the principal, here's the interest, and here's the time. To equate that to changing values, the interest now has gone down to four and a quarter. The time period is less, one year. The principal is still $1,000, and that's what the value changes by those changing conditions of interest and time. Interest and time, a key part of financial analysis and financial money. So these are kind of reviews of these topics for us this week. Take a look at the videos in week two. Take a look at these calculations. We're going to practice more of them in our Friday video. And this, this refers to uh, another section of uh, week two. 
and relationship. Well, how does this relate to risk and return that we calculated and learned about last week? Well, uh, risk in bonds is pretty nice. You're guaranteed a payment over time. You have coupon payments where you get the money. One of the nice things about bond invest investments is you know you're going to get paid. If the company defaults, they're going to have to sell assets to pay you. The bad thing about that is, is with stocks, you never know when you're going to get paid. It's a crapshoot. But the, the opportunity for return, as we talk about next week, the risk of return is greater. Remember the capital asset pricing model we talked about last week, the return on equity. It's usually much higher than the return on bonds when you just get the interest or the coupon payment. The typical example today is the current 10-year uh, United States Treasury yield is 1.6%. But if I put money in the stock market today in the S&P 500, I'm going to average a return of close to 10% a year. 10% for stocks, 1.6% for low-risk bonds. Hmm. That's why people are investing in the stock market. The risk is a little bit greater, but the return is much greater than the low return of risk-free debt. And this is a, a type of financial management issues we'll be talking throughout this class. So something to refresh your memory on, look at these videos, understand the concept of present value, and we'll look at some problems practicing these in my Friday video, in addition to talking about that article that talks a lot about this discussion of capital asset pricing model and interest rates and the changing way that finance is today as it was 20 years ago. That's why that article is so informative to read. And we'll discuss that on Friday. So this is our starting point for our week number two analysis. We're continuing our discussion of capital valuation of learning about how time value of money, the definition of debt or credit investment bonds. Remember bonds is the greatest source of capital for most American corporations. It's the cheapest form of financing. All you have to do is you know when you have to pay it back. You have your coupon payments and you have your maturity date. And those coupon payments are tax deductible as interest. That's why so many companies borrow money in the bond market. Now, naturally, small businesses can't use the bond market. It's too expensive. You have to hire accountants and lawyers and investment bankers to represent you in the bond market. But for major corporations, bond funding is the way to go. For major government agencies, bond financing. How do you think we finance the creation of and building of our schools? bond financing. How do we finance the, the, our state government in California? Bond financing. How we, do we finance the federal government? Bond financing. Those are the greatest sources of capital for corporations and large borrowing of money. Banks, because of their credit reserves, cannot issue large amounts of debt. They're subjected to their capital reserves that they're required to keep on on board or as reserves in their bank because they can't lend out all the money that deposits give depositors give them because that would be making the bank too easy to fail. So that's why big money, big money to borrow is in the form of bonds. And this all equates to risk and return. The greater the risk of a bond agency or a government agency or a company, company, the higher the interest rate they have to pay on coupon payments of that obligation. And we'll talk about this in relationship to stocks next week in chapter seven. So that's my introduction lecture for this week, number two. I continue to get to know and review Blackboard. Continue to make sure you uh, stay up to date with this. And on Friday, I'll post another video which gives us some more examples of these calculations so you can practice them in a spreadsheet because the spreadsheet is will we be doing these ana analysis in our case studies. Again, I have a Thursday night uh, student hours from six to eight, where any of you can come on and ask me questions about this material. Again, there's no graded work again this week, so that it's just getting back up to speed and getting into the swing of things. And then look for my video on Friday. So everybody, thanks a lot. Have a great week, and we'll see you again on Friday. Adios. <laughs>